All right, welcome back to our tailhook booth here. We are honored to be joined by Vice Admiral Kenny Weitzel, also known as the Air Boss, a guy I've known for a long time. Admiral, thanks for joining us. Thanks. It is very surreal. You even saying the word uh, Admiral in front of me because you and I were RAG instructors at VF 101, big fighter, grim reapers, late 80s, 90s time frame. To say that we're friends is an understatement uh, completely. Uh, uh, I appreciate you, uh, you letting me come on and talk, uh, and talk with you. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> Very proud of your trajectory. Um, before we wax nostalgic, let's get down to, because you're a busy man with little time. Uh, so yesterday was death by panels for you. Yes, it was. So let's start at the 30,000 foot level. Okay. How would you assess the health of our Naval Air Forces? Yeah, right now from uh, the stuff that I'm required to do from the man training and equip side of the house, I'll start down at the equipment side. We're probably, we are in a better condition than I've ever been in my 39 years. And that's just, you know, that's not, that's not me taking any credit for it. It's the, the aviation enterprise as a whole. Yesterday, uh, this morning I got up and nine of 12 full type model series, at full, they're at full mission capability and six of the 12 are at full mission capability. Mission capable for the first set of numbers and then full mission capable. You and I grew up in days when there was bare firewalls uh, and we're swapping boxes, cannibalizations. We're only cannibalizing about four to five uh, boxes per 100 stories and 100 uh, hours right now. You know, we're moving across both mission cable and full mission cable, and when you look at naval aviation as a whole, we're either brand new airplanes, we're upgrading airplanes, or we have the drawing boards for the airplanes that we need to we need to uh, we need to upgrade. We're the healthiest we've ever been from the equipment side of the house. In the training side, is absolutely phenomenal with the uh, integrated training facility at Fallon, Nevada, the advance and congressional expansion of the Fallon Range uh, complex, the training officer WTI syllabus. We just upgraded that syllabus so we can be a joint integrated from seabed all the way to space. Aviators are uh, taking the lead for that. So the training side of the house is absolutely phenomenal. Live virtual constructive is the way we're going to fight and uh, train uh, so that we don't show the threat uh, how we're going to fight. Now we're deploying live virtual capable, live virtual constructive on board the carriers. Uh, so you can go out on a mission, no blue airplanes, no red airplanes around you, and you can have injects to look like you're battling World War IV. It is absolutely impressive. Manning side, we've got some work to do. The retention piece, you know, the airlines are uh, hiring probably at a, at a pace that I've never seen in my, uh, in my bunch of years in the Navy. So, you know, we have work to do uh, to keep the kids in the service that we, need to, that we need to fly once we've trained them. And the same thing with our enlisted, our enlisted side of the house. Uh, we've got to go through through initiatives to keep them in. When it comes to the accession piece, you know, we're still turning people away in naval aviation. We bring in about 900 kids a year, aviators, uh, and we still are turning uh, turning folks away. So the quality and the quantity uh, coming in is absolutely phenomenal. So we're you know we're in a we're in a pretty good position. We've on the margins and some 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 other ruffles on the margins. We've got work to do. How are we doing with aircraft carrier readiness specifically? Because yeah. you hear rumors about uh, we can only put five to see at any given time. So if China goes hot, we won't be able to mobilize like we did during Desert Storm. Ford took a while to get to sea, and yeah. we had to extend. Um, which which carrier did we have to extend? Was that Truman that we had to extend? extend Truman. Um, and Truman had a long cruise anyway, so we're back to the op tempo is getting to be kind of numbers that look pretty big um, and as we know intimately that can affect readiness down the down the line so how, how are we looking with our carrier force there's two uh, kind of pillars that that I watch uh, one of them is obviously the CNO and how successful he is to hold us at seven month deployment and he's been relatively successful for that the reason uh, you know Truman and the carriers are staying out is because of uh, aircraft carrier maintenance so going into the the incremental availabilities the docking availabilities as well as RCOH uh, is the is the the long pole in the tent right now if we can get carrier maintenance to stay on schedule and on timeline as well as new deliveries because John F. Kennedy is in the yards and Huntington Ingalls is going to come out uh, second in the Ford class carrier. Um, you know, we can keep the deployments at uh, seven months. Like I said, Admiral Gilday, now Admiral Frank Hetty, has been very good competing to stay within the GFM uh, uh, model that we, have, uh, that we have right now. Nimitz is uh, going to get extended for her life because we've got enough Tron still left in the tank. And I just got uh, 
the COA was just uh, briefed to do the exact same thing with Ike. So what I think is going to happen is the Nimitz class carriers are going to get one more uh, one more deployment out of them beyond what plan was, and then Ford's doing phenomenal. We've got to get John uh, John F. Kennedy out so that the Ford class carriers can now jump in with the Nimitz class carriers and uh, uh, and contribute to the fight. So. You're right. The Ford, the Ford was interesting. You know, when you take all of that brand new technology and lump it into one platform, we shouldn't have been surprised by, you know, that technology maturation. By sending her out on that mini deployment, that Rim East type of deployment, we learned a lot of lessons on that, and we're paying. It's paying off for us right now. She's on a very successful uh, deployment in the Mediterranean and uh, supporting Ukrainian operations. And that's going to be around the world cruise ultimately. Or, or? Uh, nope, she'll come back to uh, Ford's going to stay on the East Coast, and okay. uh, Kennedy right now looks like uh, at least the current plan. Kennedy will uh, do the around the world and uh, come up. Uh, uh, come up for us on our side. And we've got to do some infrastructure modifications. She'll go up to the northwest, uh, won't be down in uh, North Island. So Kennedy will go around the Horn and go up north. So what a, you mentioned Ford being in the, I, I assume the Adriatic. Um, what are the nature of those those ops supporting NATO? Long, long sorties, I mean, the, the, it just seems like kind of an incredible yeah. effort there. Yeah, they've got, uh, you know, it's uh, they're, you know a couple double cycle sorties. Truly the, the workhorse over there is the E2 because it's uh, the situational awareness that that electronically scanned uh, antenna and the digital platform that E2D is right now is, uh, you know, it's, it's the workhorse of the fleet. The strike fighters are uh, are deading into, into other countries. We're just, we're just providing the overwatch uh, so that you know, our NATO partners know exactly that we're, you know, we are a partner, we are there, we're in the fight with them, and we're reassuring those partners and allies that, uh, that if something should happen incredibly strange, we're poised to, to join with uh, the NATO uh, partners and contribute. So our good friend Admiral Aquilino is here, another yeah. Tomcat guy. I have one yeah. sortie with him in a TF-16N <laughs> at VF-43. Again, sleep, huh? cooking it. No, no, I did not. Uh, kicking it old school, right? So uh, as I'm proud of your trajectory, also proud of Long. So in his AOR, oh, yeah. how are we looking in, for, in terms of what Reagan's doing and any other carriers that are over there supplementing what they do? Yeah, the, uh, obviously over the last couple of years, the, uh, the Western Pacific has, uh, has heated up significantly. So, you know, for us, it used to be the old days when, you know, you and I were in, we just sped through the Western Pacific and we were on our way to the Gulf. That's, that's not happening anymore. The, the contribution of allies and partners, we're doing uh, uh, multiple, uh, multiple surface ops with, uh, with our partners. The carrier is a centerpiece. Uh, for that is we operate with the Japanese, uh, their version of a carrier. The French have been over there. The British have, uh, have been there, and the carrier remains the centerpiece. FDNF, you, you, know, you hit the nail on the head uh, with Reagan, and then we try to, we, uh, our integration piece is probably, at least from the post-cruise debriefs that I've got, the integration piece with uh, allies and partners have been absolutely spectacular so that we don't have to, on day one, if things should go kinetic and deterrence fails, if we have to go kinetic, uh, uh, we are already rehearsing with our allies what we're going to do. And uh, that not just as in the old days where we just made sure that we were proficient ourselves, we're training with uh, with our allies and partners over there. And the friends are are starting to stack up. They they see the uh, the alliance between uh, Russia and China, and uh, they have the choice. You know, the United States and our growing allies and partners or a very lone group of uh, Russian and China alliance. So you mentioned the training piece. We are headquartered in Annapolis. MIDs are always asking me about the length of a pool. Yeah. So how are we doing in terms of that part yeah, of the Yeah, we've equation? dropped, that was, you know, that's one of the, you know, as I walk out the door here in two weeks, that's, you know, one of the dark spots uh, for me. We had. We've had a pool of upwards of a thousand knife students, the Navy introductory flight uh, environment, uh, prior to getting started. We were, as we bring in about 900 to 1,000 kids a year, we were 10% underproducing every year. And that 10% led up to 100, 100, 100. And now over 10 years, it was 1,000. We were at 14 month backlog time frame, and we're down to about six to seven months now of backlog, which is handleable because now the syllabus, it gives us the preload to get into knife, two phases of knife, the academic side and then the flight side of the house. The other thing that's helping us out too is the powered flight program that the academy runs. You know, unbeknownst to me yep. and uh, as we were running the program, these kids were completing powered flight program at the academy and then coming down and flying again in phase two, the flight program for knife. You know, 
just the inefficiencies as we started to peel back the onion. Exactly the same principles from that Naval Sustainment System Aviation performed a plan. Now we're just you employ those principles that gave us mission capable and full mission capable. That same principles can be attacked any problem that that we've got. And as soon as we went after that, went after knife, uh, we were able to to at least get the train going down the right track. So right now. Naval Academy Mid is probably going to have about six to seven months of, uh, of pool time before they start knife. Okay, okay. Well, that's better than 14 months, right? Yeah, we're moving in the right direction. Okay. So, what's your horizon now? Obviously, we have some political machinations happening affecting uh, changes of command. Yep. Um, I think Admiral Gilday has, has, unlike some of the other services, said we're, we're going to let folks retire. So yeah. I, what's, what's your status? Uh, I'm retiring on time. So uh, September 7th is, uh, is the ceremony day, and then I'll take a little bit of time off after that. So what we've got is uh, George Wyckoff, uh, who is headed to Fifth Fleet, but being held up because of the three-star nomination, non-confirmation. He's going to come in as the acting uh, air boss until uh, the Senate can uh, complete confirmations and then ultimately Ultimately, uh, Dan Cheever, under Cheever, is the guy that has been nominated to be the, the tenth air boss. Uh, he is waiting in the wings. He's working at Third Fleet uh, right now, um, so he's he's in the area and he's uh, getting reblued uh, after he's coming out of Northcom uh, AOR, and then uh, he'll step in as soon as the Senate can do the confirmations. So I'm a Wyckoff, was Lieutenant Wyckoff when I was a department right. head in VF-102, right. fighting the great Bosnian war abo aboard USS America. Yeah. So again, very yeah. proud of, uh, we were just talking to him and under. Yeah. So the end is near. Yes. It's got to be kind of surreal for you. So as you think about your tenure, highs and lows, let's start with one of your turnover items from your predecessor, Bullet Miller, was the Top Gun Maverick project. Yeah. So you were read into that. Yep. It was like as secret as anything as you've yeah. ever dealt with. Yep. So you got to attend the red carpet things, and yeah. you had Tom Cruise on the speed dial, and he had you on the speed <laughs> dial. So what was that experience like, and what do, what do you think about when you think about that well, time? So the first thing for the cool part of it is you and I remember the first Top Gun. Yes, I was in VF-32. And VF then a, a 142 guy. Yes. So then now Top Gun Maverick comes out, and it's like... There's flashbacks to, okay, what was my behavior like as a lieutenant at the original Top Gun movie? And then, am I supposed to grow up for Top Gun Maverick? And then seeing him <laughs> come in and and truly get getting to interact with him. Uh, you know, Bullet did all the work for it, and then they delayed the movie for uh, COVID. And then when the movie comes out, I think the, you know, the big takeaway from it was, you know, not only the surrealness of not being around in the military for Top Gun 1 and then Top Gun Maverick, was how, how considerate, professional, and how nice he was to our junior and enlisted sailors. You're, you, when, he, when they rolled the red carpet out, it, no kidding, was there at the base theater with two showings at the base theater. And there were there were blocks set up and for the, and they had some, we had crowds, but they were military crowds. And he truly was, you know, uh, he was an incredible professional and just couldn't thank us enough for uh, for being able to do the movie and to fly in the movie, the flying scenes. The star of the movie, as you know, is always the airplane. Tomcat yeah. on the first one, Super Hornet on the second well, one. Well, I'd so, say the Tomcat's the star of the second one, too, I, right? I know. It kind How of did that, saved the movie, right? That, it did, yeah. it did. Yeah. Who could have thought of that? So, you know, that was definitely an, un, an unreal time. Uh, just to know that we've been around for both, uh, you know, both movies, and then got to be up close and personal for for movie number two, and and uh, we'll see how it helps us out with the re recruiting side of the house. And 1.4 billion dollars in uh, in sales, I think it's gonna, I think no, it's gonna help us good. out. So, um, so other high points of your tenure uh, on the operational side, what comes to mind? First one was uh, as I took over on uh, the second of October of 20. We were still just uh, we were thinking about emerging out of COVID. But after working for Admiral Aquilino at it uh, at Pack Fleet, we never missed a beat, a mission beat for carrier deployments or expeditionary deployments. So there were a lot of strange procedures: no uh, no carrier port visits, uh, ROM sequester, 14 days in hotel rooms. I was very proud how the resilience of our sailors and officers and chiefs, how they pulled themselves out of COVID-19 and jumped right in without skipping a beat. You know, our mission never faltered. Our people. We were riding them pretty hard and expecting a lot out of them, uh, and they came through. Uh, they never skipped a beat either. Uh, 
I was, I'm forever in debt for them for how they performed all the way through this. And coming out of COVID was, was a strange environment. We had no idea, multiple vaccines, controversy over vaccines, deployment dates stayed the same. 14 days, then 10 days in hotel rooms, Com 2X and Go, which extended, uh, and then, you know, no port calls. The reason you and I joined the Navy was to see the world. How about some uh, low points of, of your time as Air Boss? Anytime you have a class alpha, you know, and you, you lose you lose aviators, that's the, uh, that's the low point. So Bullet uh, had a phenomenal year in 2020. Uh, right as September 31st clicked over, no no fatalities in uh, fiscal year 20, and then within three weeks uh, we had a we had a tragic accident in uh, T6, uh, two f- two females uh, killed themselves. So you know, I'm going to take you know I'll take away the the tragedy. I'll take away the you know why uh, what could have been done to to prevent to prevent that uh, uh, that from happening uh, again. And then uh, you know that's that's it's a dangerous business. We try to mitigate it uh, through various various operational levels, uh, but then, uh, just like the Harrier, the uh, Hornet crashed two nights ago. You know, it's just uh, the human toll uh, is, is the low point. It's a safer business than when you and I were flying yeah. Tomcats, but, yeah, right. but it still is a dangerous business. Yeah. Yeah. And the other one that I've focused on on my channel is the F-35 on Vincent, the yeah. ramp strike. And what do you think the takeaways are? Are you satisfied that the, yeah. the community has learned from that, that yeah. high visibility mishap? So uh, I think that the takeaway for it, just despite the automation, you know, there's still work that we have to do. So this is one we set back on our on our laurels and go, we gave you everything, all the cues were there available for you, don't do it again. You know, we went back through and now, well, one of the key takeaways for it is there's no outside queue for the LSOs to know, you know, what mode it's in. So, you know, this isn't one where you sit back, do the investigation, go through all the administrative uh, procedures, and then you go, okay, just send out some message, okay, don't do this again. This is one where uh, was this constant improvement, constant self-assessment. That was a takeaway for us. Make the queue a little bit more evident uh, for the inside of the cockpit, but then give us a queue outside of the cockpit so that so the LSOs would know. Because remember, they were also they were a boiled frog too. They yes, been on, they had yes. been on a successful deployment and were about ready. Uh, you know, again, the last day in the Western Pacific, they were about ready to start heading uh, east and coming back home. So, you know, the Swiss cheese that you and I grew up with, it just stacked and stacked yep. and stacked, and all of it aligned for that. So, yep. it's just not the kid in the cockpit. It right. wasn't just that. So, as we talk about the F-35, are you liking that as part of the air wing? As you talk about the air wing of the future, are we in a good place and headed to yeah. a good capability going forward? That's a great question. I tell you, I. After uh, after two deployments and a third deployment, now coming up on Vincent, uh, coming up in uh, in less than a month, that airplane has absolutely changed uh, not only our coordination with allies and partners, but it's changed uh, changed what the threat thinks to, and the way that plane has been able to interact. Uh, over in the Western Pacific is absolutely phenomenal, mostly because, not because of the, the, the specific superiority uh, capabilities within that airplane, but it is built, and we have built it, to interact with the rest of the air wing, and so it is truly a, it is a, you know, the game changer is always a, is an overused word, but it is a, mul- a true force multiplier when you combine it with E2D, with combine it with Growler and its capabilities and the Super Hornet. It really takes the whole air wing to another level. Uh, obviously, you can't talk a lot of it about it on, a, on an unclassified area, but uh, we took the debrief from 147 down to Lockheed Martin so that they could see you know, the, the final part of their product. And uh, you know, that was they were smiling from ear to ear to see how well that thing works. How are you liking the V-22 as the cot? Is that working out? Yeah, it's been a phenomenal platform for us. You know, it's got, got incredible capabilities. The biggest thing is now I can come aboard, fly it uh, 24 hours. I can fly at nighttime, which we normally didn't do with the cod. Right. Uh, because of the vertical piece to it, it can fly just, a, it can fly into anywhere. So uh, nighttime medical, Kazivac, we've been able to demonstrate that. Uh, when parts are available, we don't have to wait. We'll wait till the flight schedule starts the next day. The only thing that we're changing on that now is during the turnover and to get CMB22 up to speed, we essentially said, 
take the VRC playbook and turn it, just make it look like VRM side of the house. That plane has a lot more capabilities. So Admiral Paparo uh, told me to blow up the, uh, the concept of employment and the concept of, uh, uh, of operational employment. And we're rewriting the concept right now all the way from, you know, could we hang weapons on it? What capabilities can we put inside it to, to again, uh, allow us to do the distributed maritime uh, operations? Kind of watching what the Marines do with MV-22, and then now from us with the CMV-22, how we can uh, make it a force multiplier from a combat perspective for uh, naval aviation. My audience is very interested in the unmanned piece, yeah. so MQ-25 yeah. and this sort of thing, is that also the right way to go in your opinion? Yeah, it is. The, uh, you know, for us to be able to, to for the high-end fight, it's going to be a distance fight. Uh, so MQ-25 slid a year, you know, a little disappointed uh, in that, but it's going to be the, it's going to be the capability that, that we need to get our long-range weapons and long-range aircraft uh, out to the distances that we need uh, that we need to have, uh, and the other thing, it's going to relieve the fatigue on ENF uh, as a as a tanking platform. When you combine PLM and all of our automatic landing modes, combine MQ-25, now the we're going to extend you know, the life, the potential to extend the life of ENF, not to have to tank, come aboard the first time uh, correctly, not coming aboard with uh, those fuel, you know, five wet or three wet tanks hanging on you. You know, I think we're going to get second and third order effects that are positive because of MQ-25. Triton, you know, talk about other unmanned platforms. Uh, IOC is, spiral IOC is going on right now in Guam. We just got the first two platforms back out there from early operational capability last year with two platforms out and a third one's going out here within the next 30 days. Uh, that's going to operate, you know, reconnaissance tracks uh, so that we can have uh, that unblinking eye in a theater where we can't afford to, to come off our game anytime during the day. And then uh, fire scout on the SWO boss's ships, again, to be able to extend the eye for that surface uh, warfighter on destroyers and LCS so that we can extend the fight out, uh, out for them. Uh, especially look at the threats with PAFM, as well as the, the Chinese Coast Guard, as well as their gray ships. I mean, we just need to overwhelm in as many domains as possible. And manned unmanned teaming is the path for us to, to create that overwhelming. Uh, so bottom line is we're on path to meet current and future threats. We're on path. We are with FAXX and Family of Systems. These three platforms right now are teaching us how, you know, how we take machine language, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, how we do that, and now take it into the next platform. Because, you know, while, while Triton's ISR, MQ-25 is ISR with, uh, with some capabilities on it, uh, or Fire Scout, then MQ-25's tank with other capabilities that are gonna be in it. The next, the next unmanned thing, is being purposefully built for combat. So we're learning lessons off these three that are going to be that are already being melded into the next set of platforms that are going on board the carrier. The end of the road is coming for you. Yeah. You're going to have to leave the clubhouse, as yeah. we say. What emotions, as you've had some time to conceive of this, obviously yeah. you're the busiest man on the planet, as evidenced by all the things you get called away to do here. Yeah. Um, but what, what emotions are hitting you as you uh, think about the next chapter? Uh, I, I go back to the first squadron. I go back to us as JOs. And, you know, it has seemed like a blur as fast as it went by because you go back every single time I think about what's going to happen on September 7th. I think about what happened on in October 24 of 1984 when I gave the gunnery sergeant a salute down in Pensacola. There is a, uh, how in the world did I get here? You know, I look at the COs and great mentors. I, I looked at the quality of life that we had. I looked at the first squadron. You know, you and I stayed in because of our, you know, the, the bond, the relationships, and the first squadron piece. So there's some trepidation of cutting the tie with the, by calling yourself active duty. Uh, and, is that all to also cut the tie with your, uh, you know, with your friends? I, I think that's the opportunity now to get back and revive some of those, some of that friendships. Uh, the business part, just like you said, the busyness side, they, there'll be there'll be no problem uh, 
going to a full sprint off the podium on <laughs> September 7th and running away and then putting money back into the family bank and, uh, and uh, some bucket list stuff, uh, stuff to do. But more importantly, knowing that uh, you know, there was consequence to every tour that we did, there was some value added, uh, and everything, the one thing we hoped to do after every tour, we left the place better than we found it. And I, that's, I'm, a, well, I'm not going to have a problem on the afternoon of September 7th. Yeah. Uh, I know you, I know that's true. <laughs> well, I'm Kenny Weitzel, my good friend. Thanks, Super Mooch. proud of you. Thanks, Thanks for giving us some time today and good luck with the next chapter. Thanks, Mooch. Love you, brother. Love you too. All right, that'll do it for this episode. Thank you for viewing. If you're not a subscriber, become one. And I look forward to talking to you again very soon.